Kelly Atomic Heritage Foundation, September 6, 2013, here with Dee Ray Smith. First question, please say your name and spell it. My name is Ray Smith, that's R-A-Y-S-M-I-T-H, and I'm the historian at the Y-12 National Security Complex. Terrific. Um, now this is going to be to help us put together a little vignette of what is Oak Ridge, mm -hmm. especially for people who are visiting the Hanford site. So could you give us um, a brief um, explanation? What is Oak Ridge? Oak Ridge came about because of the Manhattan Project. Prior to 1942, about November of 1942, this was a small rural community of ridges and valleys here in East Tennessee. Now, there were small communities, and when the Manhattan Project started, there were about 3,000 people that had to leave to make room for the 60,000 acres that the government needed for the Manhattan Project. So in November of 1942, there were notices tacked up on their doors and those people had to leave in a matter of weeks. The construction began almost immediately. The reason for the construction was that General Groves wanted a plant site. He needed some place to say, this is where we're starting the Manhattan Project. Oak Ridge was that choice. Oak Ridge was intended to separate the uranium-235 for the first atomic bomb. It was uh, used to first put in place the electromagnetic separation process, which turned out to be the Y-12 site. And also, at the same time, construction was being planned and started on the graphite reactor, which is at the Oak Ridge, what's now the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The reason for that was to prove that you could produce plutonium in a uranium reactor. Once that was done, then Hanford came into play because that's where they built the reactors to produce that plutonium. And Oak Ridge continued to be the focus of the uranium-235. The other process that they started was the gaseous diffusion process at the K-25 site. And it was being developed alongside the electromagnetic process. Uh, it was first to come on but by the March of 1945, the gaseous diffusion process was coming on. And a third process, the thermal diffusion process, also fed a little bit of enriched material into the Y-12 calutrons. So in a nutshell, the reason for Oak Ridge is to produce enough uranium-235 for the little boy, first atomic bomb ever used in warfare. And that's why we came into being. The, the Y-12 site was unique in that it had never been tried before. Uh, Ernest Lawrence had developed this concept of a cyclotron that would separate, or a big mass spectrometer that would separate this uranium. And they designed something called a calutron. California University Cyclotron is what it stands for. And it was a, a, an apparatus that used magnets to separate the two isotopes of uranium, the 238 and the 235. A very simple way to think about that is if I had two rubber bands hanging down from my hand, I put a golf ball on one and a ping pong ball on the other, and I swung it for half a turn, that golf ball would stretch that rubber band further than the ping pong ball. So you get two arcs. That's what happens with uranium-235 and 238. The centrifugal force causes the 238 to make a larger arc than the 235. So you can catch that 235. That's what they were looking for. The only problem is in a thousand pounds of uranium ore, you only have seven pounds of uranium-235. So it's a very difficult process. Well, it's a simple process, but very difficult to get enough of that material. So they used 1,152 calutrons, and they had 22,000 people working on those calutrons for almost a year to get enough material for Little Boy, U-235, and have a little bit left over. A very special process that had never been tried before. And of course, the, the one interesting note is that uh, Great Britain knew, I mean, in the late 30s, the science was they were the scientists were aware that you could 
release a lot of energy if you could get enough uranium-235 together. But they didn't have the resources, Great Britain didn't have the resources to do that, so they came to the United States and said, we need you, you have those resources. And in fact, the Manhattan Project was a tremendous use of a lot of resources across the nation. The three main sites of Los Alamos, Hanford, Washington, and Oak Ridge were not all that were involved in it. There were many other people that were doing lots of things in support of them. But those were the three main sites for the Manhattan Project. Great. Can you do the same thing you did for Y-12 for K-25? Mm, I can. The other process that uh, came to be used at Oak Ridge, and in fact, after the war ended, was the process that's been used all through the Cold War to generate the uranium-235 is gaseous diffusion. Now, the gaseous diffusion process is different from the calutrons at Y-12. That was a batch process. It took 22,000 people, 1,152 calutrons. In the gaseous diffusion process, it's a continuous operation, so it takes fewer people. In fact, you can operate K25 on a tenth of what it costs to operate Y12. That's one of the reasons that they shifted to that process. Now, how it works is you have a barrier material that's inside some stages where the, where the gaseous process material is pumped through. And as it comes through, this barrier material that it passes through <clears throat> has lots of holes, very small holes. In a space the size of my thumbnail, you'll have two to three thousand, two to three hundred million holes, and they'll all be the same size, and they'll all be equally spaced. And as you push this material through, in any one process step, that 235 will go through just a little faster than the 238. So at each of those 3,000 stages, you'll begin to accumulate a little bit more, a little higher percentage of the uranium-235. So this is a continuous operation process, pumps the material in gaseous form through a barrier material that has small holes and accumulates a higher percentage of 235. Yeah, S-50, let's talk about that. The uh, calutrons at Y-12, they first thought that they would only need a few, and then when they realized how slow the process was, uh, they doubled the capacity at Y-12. And even then, they were frustrated at the slow pace. Remember, they thought they were in a race with Germany. They were afraid they were going to get the bomb first. So. Uh, Oppenheimer and Groves were thinking about how could they speed up this process, and they learned that the Navy was experimenting with something called thermal diffusion. Well, <laughs> just by chance, they had built the world's largest steam plant to produce electricity for the K-25 gaseous diffusion process. However, the barrier material wasn't hardly ready yet, so they couldn't put that process in place. But they had this huge steam plant. So Oppenheimer says to Groves, why don't we build a thermal diffusion plant here by this steam plant, use that steam, and put a slightly enriched feed material into the, K or into the Y-12 calutrons, and that should speed up the process. So Groves agreed, and that's what they did. Now Groves went to the contractor and said, uh, M.H. Ferguson at the time, said, I need a thermal diffusion plant built, I need it built by this steam plant, and I need it in 90 days. <laughs> the contractor said it can't be done. Groves looked him in the eye and said, you've got 80 days. <laughs> they built it in 76 days, operated it for three months, and by feeding that slightly enriched material into those calutrons at Y-12, they calculated that they shortened the war by three weeks. So that thermal diffusion process was a boost to help the calutrons at Y-12 get to that material sooner. And, and also in March of 1945, the gaseous diffusion process did come online and began to feed material into the calutrons at Y-12. So by May, June of 1945, they were cleaning out all of those 1,152 calutrons, getting that material out and getting out to Los Alamos so they could actually build 
the uh, needed materials to build Little Boy. So how much material did they have? Uh, Y-12 worked on those 1,152 calutrons, 22,000 people, and almost a year as they built those calutrons and, and worked the process. And ultimately they shipped about 60 kilograms, about 140 pounds, less than a gallon in volume. The way they would do that is kind of interesting. As they took the material out of those calutrons, they would put it in small gold lined coffee cup sized containers. They'd put two of them in a briefcase, strap it to an Army lieutenant's arm, dress him up to look like a salesman, put him on a passenger train up through Chicago and out to Los Alamos. That's the way all the uranium from Little Boy, for Little Boy, got transported from Y-12 out to Los Alamos. Now, an interesting thing about that, just a side note from a security standpoint, when they shipped that material out with two people they would ride that train up to Chicago and then they would transfer it to two other people and they would ride the train out to Los Alamos. So the two that went to Los Alamos knew that they got something in Chicago and took it to Los Alamos. The two that came from Oak Ridge knew they got something in Oak Ridge and took it to Chicago. But neither one of them knew where the other end point was. That was something that Groves insisted on, that kind of separation to keep the security. That's good. Um, so how many, do you know how many, uh, much material they produced during World War II? Or were they ready to? Oh, that, that's a, a, an interesting note about the amount of material for uh, atomic bombs at the time. Uh, of course, the plutonium being produced at Hanford, Washington was used in the gadget and was used in Fat Man. The uranium bomb, Little Boy, was the one that, that Y-12 produced the, and K-25 provided some, and, and S-50, the thermal diffusion, provided feed into the, feed materials into Y-12. But after having produced all that Y-12 could produce, they sent enough for Little Boy and a little left over, <laughs> not enough for another bomb. And the same thing was true with Fat Man and the Gadget. They were very low on the amount of materials for a third explosion, if you might. When President Truman threatened Japan with a reign of ruin, ruin if you don't surrender, it was somewhat of an empty threat. He didn't have another nuclear weapon or atomic bomb at the time. It would have taken some period of time to build another one. The plutonium would have been the fastest because it would have taken a good long while for Y-12 to produce enough uranium uh, for another little boy. Um, maybe you could just explain Fat Man and Little Boy for people who don't know the terms. I can. Little Boy is the one that was uh, the, plut or the uranium bomb, used uranium-235. And the way it was designed, they call it a gun barrel design. You have a little bit of uranium here, a little bit of uranium here with a barrel between them and a little dynamite behind this one to blow them together so that when this one comes down, it kind of seats itself inside the other half or piece of the material. And that gets enough of it together that it starts, the neutrons start splitting the atoms and you have an, an enormous explosion. The Fat Man bomb, on the other hand, is an implosion type bomb and it was designed with a plutonium core in the middle with 32 implosion devices on the outside that had to implode the, all at once so that you would compress that plutonium to make it go into a critical state. Now the problem that they had and the reason for, for using the gadget on, on the uh, Trinity explosion, if they only had one of those 32 that didn't go off, then you wouldn't have that compression that you needed. You'd, it'd have a blowout. So they needed to test that. Uh, they didn't need to test Little Boy. They knew that if you got enough of that material together, it was gonna e explode. And just pushing it together was all you needed. But in the Fat Man, configuration, you needed to compress that plutonium. So they needed to test that to be sure it would happen. And that's the difference between plutonium-based bomb, the fat man, and the uranium-based bomb of Little Boy. Good. 
All right. What are some other questions you get on a usual basis? Why, why 12 is always a question. And the response is that Y12 doesn't stand for anything. There was Y12, X10, which is now the, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, K25, the gaseous diffusion plant, and S50, the thermal diffusion plant. The only one of those four that might have any significance to the name is K25. The K might stand for the Kellex company that built the gaseous diffusion equipment. And the 25 is a shortcut name for uranium-235. They took the two off of the right-hand side of 92, the atomic number for uranium, and the five off of the right-hand side of 235, and they called it 25. They did the same thing with plutonium. They took the four off the right-hand side of 94, and the nine off the right-hand side of 239, and they called it 49. Uh, there's a fellow that's written a book Jeremy Bernstein, the name of his book is Plutonium, the World's Most Dangerous Material. On the cover of his book, he has a huge watermark of a four and a nine. So he knows the story. But Y-12 doesn't stand for anything. Interestingly enough, Y-12 National Security Complex still retains that original Manhattan Project name of Y-12. Most of the other sites have changed their names to other things over the years, but Y-12 proudly holds on to that signal, that, uh, that code name, Y-12. So uh, what's Oak Ridge doing to preserve its history? Hmm. Well, we're hopeful that the Senate will pass that Manhattan Project National Historical Park Bill and that we'll be a part of those three locations, Hanford, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge. Here in Oak Ridge, we are hoping that we will be able to put together a hub and a spoke concept where you would have the American Museum of Science and Energy to be the place where the National Park Service would have a, a central location here in town where they would, the visitors would learn about Oak Ridge and its history, but then also have the opportunity to go visit the K-25 site, which will be preserved with the original footprint of the U, and there'll be a history center there, a viewing tower there, and also there'll be a replica of the building itself. Now, just a small piece of it, but it'll have some of the original equipment in it so that you'll be able to see that gaseous diffusion process equipment in a setting that would uh, uh, replicate what the original building looked like. And you can see the size of the U, so you'll have an impression of how large it was. At Y-12, there will be an opportunity to visit Building 9731, which is the first building completed on the site, and it has the world's only Alpha K Atron magnet still intact inside that building. And then Beta 3, Building 9204-3, is the building that still has K atrons in it, Beta K atrons. And by the way, those K atrons continued to operate here at Y-12 for a a number of years by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory to separate isotopes that was used to feed over to the graphite reactor that would make those medical isotopes, which Dr. Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of the laboratory for many years, says is the most important contribution Oak Ridge has made to the world, those medical isotopes. Same equipment, same science that produced the uranium for little boy also produce the stable isotopes that are used as targets to produce medical isotopes. And the third part of those spokes, if you will, will be that graphite reactor, which is over at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's on the national, uh, it's a national historical landmark on the Register of Historical Places, has been since 1964. And uh, uh, it, it still has the features of the operating reactor. In other words, you can see the face, you can go into the control room, you can see the places where they actually loaded the stable isotope to produce those medical isotopes. So it, it'd be an outstanding uh, exhibit for people to see. So those three spokes off of the main hub is what we're hoping to develop as a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park here in Oak Ridge. What am I doing?
this place on a little bit about the town site and houses because that's so unique for Maybe uh, you could make it let me, let me talk started. about that a little yes, bit. <clears throat> Another aspect of the Oak Ridge history and would be a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park is the city itself and the town site, the Jackson Square area, which was the original town site. And we are renovating the guest house, which is where all of the people stayed that came here during the Manhattan Project. It's going to be a senior living center but the lobby and the exterior of the building is going to look just like it did in 1945. So a part of the National Park Tour will also include the city. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about the alphabet houses because it's sure. so interesting there they yeah. have sister alphabet houses mm -hmm. in Denver. So. Uh, one aspect of Oak Ridge's history that's still visible today are those alphabet houses. If you go up from Jackson Square and just start driving up the ridge on any of the uh, avenues that go up the hill, you'll go by the different alphabet houses. You'll go by the A's, the B's, the C's, and you'll see the larger houses up near the top of the ridge. There's a, a road up there called Old Knee Lane. They called it Snob Knob back during the Manhattan Project. But that's where Colonel Nichols lived. His home's still up there. Uh, you, it's been maintained over these years. And there are others who lived up there as well and in the larger houses in the city. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, how about the castle on the hill? Mm, about that. Okay, yeah. Just across the street, the main street of the Oak Ridge Turnpike, from the uh, uh, Jackson Square town site area is where the uh, what was called the Castle on the Hill is and the reason it was called a Castle on the Hill because it was such a large office building and and by the way it's located between Pyatt's Place and Tadlock's Farm. Now to get that into perspective I have to tell you that John Hendricks is the one who predicted that that's where that building would be placed. He's known as a local, local legend here in Oak Ridge as the prophet of Oak Ridge. Now, he died in 1915, but in about 1900, he said that there would be a large factory built in Bear Creek Valley that would help win the greatest war there'll ever be. Said there'd be a city built on Black Oak Ridge. Said there'd be a railroad spur go down by his property line. And he said the seat of power would be between Pike's Place and Tadlock's Farm. Well, as I said, he died in 1915. In 1942, November, when they came in to start the Manhattan Project, first shovel full of dirt they dug was right between Pike's Place and Tadlock's Farm. That's where they put the administration building, and that was called the Castle on the Hill, and that's where the federal office building is today. That city on Black Oak Ridge is Oak Ridge, that railroad spur runs right down by his property line in Hendricks Creek subdivision, named for John Hendricks. And of course, y 12s in Bear Creek Valley, where the uranium for Little Boy was obtained that did help win World War II. So, I don't know what you think about prophecy, but the legend is that John knew it was coming. <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> Uh, let me tell you the Senator McKellar story. Oh, you may not use it, but it, it's a good story. If you read in the history books about how this place was chosen, Oak Ridge was chosen, they'll say that it's because of these ridges and valleys. And all of East Tennessee is laid out this way. Ridges and valleys laying across the terrain, running from northeast to southwest. And they thought that if they placed the plants down in the valleys, if one of them exploded, those ridges would protect the city, which is just on the other side of Pine Ridge from Y-12. Well, I'm not sure about that, but that's what the history books say. However, what may be closer to the truth is that when Albert Einstein wrote that letter to President Roosevelt saying Germany is buying up all this uranium ore and he thought they were going to be building a bomb, Roosevelt knew it would be an expensive undertaking, so he put General Groves in charge of the Manhattan Project. Now, Groves had just finished building the Pentagon, so he knew how to put a large construction project together. He knew how to get private industry involved, <laughs> and he knew how to spend money. So, President Roosevelt also called in Senator McKellar, 
And he said, Senator, I need to put a large amount of money against the war effort, and I can't let the press or anyone know how much it is or what it's being used for. Can you help me with that? <laughs> Senator McKellar said, yes, Mr. President, I can do that for you. Just where in Tennessee are you going to put that thing? <laughs> So that may have more to do with us getting selected than any ridges and valley or lay of the land. I'm going to tell you one more Senator McKellar story, and I know this one's true because the man that it happened to is still alive today. His name's Lester Fox. He's a patriarch of the Fox Automobile dealerships in this area. But in 1942, he was a sophomore in high school in Oliver Springs, a little community just north of here. And he and his buddy were skipping school. They were playing the pinball machine. When they got through, they were walking down the main street of the little town. They walked by the telephone office. Telephone operator leaned her head out and said, Lester, go get the principal. He's got an important phone call. <laughs> Lester's skipping school. But he does. He goes and gets the principal. The principal comes and takes the phone call, comes back to the school, calls all the students together in an assembly, and says, I've just gotten a phone call from Senator McKellar. He wants me to tell you to go home and tell your parents you're going to have to find another place to live. The government's going to take your property for the war effort. Now, Lester swears that's the way these 3,000 people first learned they were going to have to get off of 60,000 acres in order to make room for the Manhattan Project. In a matter of days, they were getting notices tacked up on their door that said they had just weeks to get off the property. Many of them didn't have automobiles. They didn't have trucks to move their belongings. If they had an automobile, they might not be able to buy gas for it or tires. Those things were rationed. <laughs> but what they did have was young men in the military getting killed in that war. And they wanted to do anything they could to help stop the killing. So they got off their property in a matter of weeks in order to make room for the Manhattan Project. Uh, let's, let, me, let me say something about the sites, the designators for the sites. Oak Ridge, being the first site that was started, was designated the X site. Now, of course, we had the Y-12, X-10, uh, what turned out to be the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the uh, K-25 and S50, K25 being gaseous diffusion, S50 being thermal diffusion. Those were located at the X site here in Oak Ridge. The Los Alamos site was the Y site. And then in Hanford, Hanford was designated the W site. Now, of course, Los Alamos is where the material was being shipped to and, and Fat Man and Little Boy and the Gadget were assembled there. But the, the process materials coming from the X site to the Y site, and from the W site to the Y site, uh, is the way that you have to look at the Manhattan Project, the three sites and how they were complementary. Plutonium coming from the Hanford site, uranium coming from the X site here in Oak Ridge, and then the assembly work that was done at Los Alamos. Once again, okay. Y, Z. Yeah, that's <laughs> what yeah, right. <laughs> <That's> X, Y, W. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's cool. mm -hmm. um, now, there were checking stations built. To oh, okay, let's talk about it very quickly. Uh, Oak Ridge started in 1942 and was a secret city, a closed city, until March of 1949. During that period of time, there was seven gates around Oak Ridge that you could come through, and when you came through the gates, you had to have a reason for being here, someone that you were coming to see, or have a badge to get in. Everyone with age 12 or above wore a badge. But in March of 1949, the decision was made to open up the city of Oak Ridge to let the public in. Uh, not all Oak Ridgers thought that was a good idea. They had grown to like the uh, uh, security, if you will, of being in a what might have been one of the first gated communities. But they decided to, or the government decided to open it up. And when they did, they decided to build these check-in stations. There's three of them still here today. 
There's one on uh, uh, Bethel Valley Road, which was to isolate the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. There's one on Scarborough Road that was to isolate the Y-12 plant. And there's one on, Oak Ridge, on the Oak Ridge Turnpike out to the west that was to isolate the K-25 site. So they were used to let the public come into the main part of the city, but to keep them away from the three government sites unless they were authorized to go there. So they used those checking stations uh, from 1949 until 1953. In 1953, they decided to move the fences back to the actual sites. And they did, and when they did that, they no longer needed the check-in stations. So the check-in stations have continued to be here. Uh, they were included in, uh, in the historic district of Oak Ridge back in the middle 90s when they were looking at that. And two of them have been renovated and are used as small meeting places. They're decorated with many of Ed Westcott's photographs. And uh, we use them just to have meetings for people coming into town that can't get to the sites, but we can meet with them in those little check-in stations. Two of them. The, the one over on Bethel Valley Road has not been renovated. It's been painted and to keep it from deteriorating, but the inside of it hadn't been renovated.